I've been doing a lot of thinking about Western civilization over the last week. The date today is November 16th, 2016. So a lot's happening in the world today. A lot of upheaval, a lot of different things happening around the world, globally, and in the region we live in. I'm in Tennessee right now doing this at East Tennessee State University, in the southeast of the United States. And so I come to you talking about the emergence of Greek civilization, which is one of the cornerstones of Western thought as we have known it for the past 2,000 years. And I think what I'd like to say to all of you out there listening, what I'd like to say to you is that Western thought is one trajectory in a myriad of threads of human development globally, each unique, each important. So whatever civilization it is that we're learning about, whatever corner of the world that we're tracing from the origins, from the hunter-gatherer, from the Stone Age writers, through the Bronze Age, it's all important, and it's each unique. And that we are a product of that which comes before us. And so I like to honor the ancient Greeks for what they've given to Western thoughts. So the art of ancient Greece. This first lecture is the emergence of Greek civilization, and we're going to look at what's called the geometric period and the orientalizing period. So here's a map. And on this map, let's look at Athens, Delphi, and Paestum, because that's the first places where we're going to go in looking at Greek art. Now, the Greeks were a seafaring people, and you can see here we've just come from Crete, and the Cyclades Islands and Mycenae. So we're all still in the same place. If you look down in this little inset, see where Sparta is and that Vafeo cup was found just below Sparta. And that's where all those shaft graves were. We haven't seen Athens yet, of course, but the Greeks sailed this entire Mediterranean. They went over to Troy, they went to Pergamon, and that's you know much later too. There was a great deal of conflict throughout the entire Mediterranean, but at their height, it was quite a large empire. So by the Hellenistic period, which is the later period in Greek art, their influence expended all the way to Macedonia, down to Egypt, into Asia Meyer. You can see Phoenicia over here. You can see, and of course, the Greeks had a great influence on the ancient Romans that we'll see in the next set of lectures. And you can see how close Greece and Rome are. They are two completely different places with a different history, but they are close by geographically and the people People are similar. So the best way to introduce ancient Greek art and culture is to look at how the Greeks defined themselves in the ancient world. And this is a new concept. We really have not talked about this before. The Egyptians did not define themselves against another culture. They were who they were. They were such a widespread and developed civilization that they didn't even think about any other civilization. They were who they were. The Greeks really defined themselves against other groups of people. And I think this idea of them defining themselves against other groups of people is what prompted my introductory thoughts today. Because as soon as you look at a culture that defines itself against other cultures or in relationship to other cultures, it sets up all sorts of ancillary conversations, if you will. So we're going to answer these questions that the Greeks are asking themselves. They're asking themselves, what does it mean to be Greek? How is being a member of Greek society different than being Egyptian or Persian or Gaul? All of which were cultures that they saw, all of which were cultures that was very, very different from theirs. And so they look at these other cultures and they're like, wait a minute, you know, how are we different? Who are we? So they we're going to answer these questions by looking at their art because it's through their art that they define themselves. So for this first lecture, 
In this, here's a little outline. We're going to look at what the historical divisions of Greek art are, sort of an overview. And we're going to talk about Athens and the concept of democratic rule. Actually, that's in the next set of lectures, but it's important to think about here. Just the idea, I think all I need to introduce about that is that the concept of democratic rule originated in Athens. We'll look at their religious beliefs, their sacred places, and Greek and Roman deities and heroes, and then in terms of artwork, the geometric period and the orientalizing period. So the actual names of the periods, here they are. I've got two groups from 1000 to 500 BCE is sort of the origins of their civilization, if you will, the roots, the, the soup of thought and ideas that swirls around and begins to crystallize around 600 to 480 in the Archaic period. And then after 500 BCE, we have this crystallization from very quickly from 480 to 330 BCE. So it's really only a period of you know less than 200 years. So the geometric period from 900 to 700 is named for geometric forms on ceramics. And then the Oriental Orientalizing period is named for the influence of Egypt and Near Eastern art. The archaic period is supposedly a contrast between that art and that art of the later period, although I'll leave it to you to see whether you think those divisions are blurred or not. And then we have classical, which was once thought to be the most admirable, although that's coming into question too. The final phase was called Hellenistic, and the word means Greek-like. And it was artwork that was produced throughout the Mediterranean because non-Greek people began to be introduced to Greek styles. And there was, again, we talk about this cultural identification, that cultural identification weakens, begins to disseminate amongst other cultures. So the Greeks believed that man is the measure of all things. Now, it's important to me that you understand that from this point on, we're going to be talking about beliefs that certain civilizations held, and these beliefs were very important to them. We may agree with some of the things they believed, or we may not agree with some of the things they believed. To understand who they were, we need to understand their belief systems. So they believed that humans were supreme, that man is above nature, but they also believed, and I believe this is very important when you look at the way Western thought has kind of progressed, they believed that humanity was also defined as Greek. So to be human was to be Greek. To, to get quintessential perfection, you would be Greek, a Greek human. Their wealth came from commerce. There was very little agriculture. They were a manufacturing people. And their colonies remained very, very tied to the homeland by language, tradition, religion, and history. They also lived under very harsh conditions. There was constant warfare throughout their entire culture. They had short periods of peace, but not long. And they always sought perfection. And that is the hallmark of the ancient Greece and the hallmark of their humanity is that they were constantly seeking to improve, to perfect themselves in everything that they did. So this is a very big contrast, for example, with the Egyptian desire for continuity and permanence. We don't see the ancient Greeks building tombs and then creating houses for themselves to live in for all eternity. They actually have fu funeral pyres. They burn their dead. They don't try to take their artifacts with them. They create perfection on earth, and when they die, they go to be with the gods. Their culture was very, very short. It was less than a thousand years, so less than a third, less, less than actually a quarter. If you, if you count the Neolithic time, Egyptian culture, you can sort of say back almost four or five thousand years if you count the Neolithic. With the Greeks, much, much shorter. And the periods in Greek art really reflect stylistic conventions rather than political ones. Athletics, education, philosophy, and government, all of these things that we have today, all have roots in ancient Greece and Greek thinking. 
so it's worthwhile to study a little bit about them. Beyond the measure of this course, I would say, because we can only touch on the surface here. So their culture became very disorganized after the fall of Mycenaeans. So the Greeks did arise out of that Mycenaean culture. And if you remember, that lasted quite a long time and they spread out quite far and they were very unified, the Mycenaeans were. But once the Mycenaeans fell, they sort of divided into small groups in self-sufficient communities, but they all spoke the same language. And this is a thing that really has a great effect on a civilization as a whole, is its language. So even though they weren't necessarily all organized into one large empire, they all spoke the same language. So when they would travel to one or another, they understood each other. By the 9th and 8th centuries, they began to develop a city-state culture. So again, this is something we've seen before. It's pretty common to all of these ancient civilizations. And their power depended on their manufacturing skill and their military strength, and not so much on agriculture. By the 7th century BCE, they began using coins and they began using alphabetic writing. So Corinth is the oldest and is the most powerful city-state. By 600 BCE, Athens gains power. So again, this is a very general overview of this entire Greek history. So I'm presenting this to you as a backdrop so that you could, when we see specific works of artwork, you can sort of go back to this, plug them back into this timeline backdrop, if you will. By 594, a man named Solon, I think that's how you pronounce it, I'm not sure, became the political leader of Athens and he developed a judiciary and a constitutional government. So by 500, a full democratic government was in place, although only men could be the citizens of it, but it was called a democracy, they had voting. And Sparta was the only warrior aristocracy. So we have this period of relative peace for somewhere around 50 years. And in 479, Greece begins war with Persia. Athens becomes a leader in that time. And I'll say a little bit more about that later. So under Pericles, in this age, these united Greeks under this democratic system began building and they had unrivaled artistic achievements. And I say this over and over again, when you have a civilization of builders and a civilization of relative peace, these are the hallmarks of great civilization throughout history. So by 359 BCE, Philip II came to the throne of Macedonia. And in 338, he defeated Athens, the other Greek cities in 336, Philip II, was assassinated, Alexander came to power, Alexander began conquering by 331, he had conquered Syria, Phoenicia, Asia Minor, and Egypt. He was named Amun, he conquered Persepolis, which he accidentally burned down, he reached India in 326. So he was a conqueror and his, re his troops actually refused to go any further and he headed home and he died on the way home. He's only 33 years old after he'd accomplished all that. And so his empire got divided up. So that brings us up to this same period that we saw at the end of the ancient Near Eastern civilization and at the end of the Egyptian civilization, this fourth and third centuries BCE. Antioch, Jerusalem, and Athens are all flourishing under their own rulers. So that's your timeline, and we'll revisit some of those events, but just to give you sort of an overview there. So I want to turn now from the actual events that happen to consciousness. Greek art is marked by a radical shift in consciousness. So what is consciousness? If you think about your own self, look out through your two eyes, you're conscious of me, you're conscious of whatever the space is like around you. Maybe you're listening to me on the phone in the car, or maybe you're in your room, or maybe you're on a park bench. You're conscious of the world around you. You are aware of who you are, of the place you're in, of what you had for breakfast, lunch, or dinner this morning, whether you got a good night's sleep, different pressures that are on you, all the things that you need to do or get done, all of those things together. 
make up our consciousness. But there's another meaning for consciousness also, which is a totality of attitudes held by an individual. So I'm going to use the, this meaning A says individual or group, but I want to break it down a little more. So you have your consciousness of yourself, just as who you are, where you are, what you feel like, what's going on, your, your personal self. And then you have consciousness that is the all of your attitudes or your opinions or your sensitivities or your consciousness that has been created by an influence of social constructs, things you read, things you hear, things you see on the internet, people you talk to, people you agree with, people you don't agree with, groups, you know, th th that kind of thing that all of your attitudes or opinions or sensitivities of how you want to act, who you want to be, that is another layer of what your consciousness is, is that who you are in terms of who you are ideologically in relationship to the world around you. And then the third layer is actually groups have their own consciousness. So the totality of attitudes or in opinions and sensitivities will be held by a group as well. So the individuals of any particular group, depending on the ideology of the group or the individual, may or may not line up with each other or be the same, but it is three layers, if you will. So one way to understand this, and I'm going to use an example from our own culture, and I'm going to say right from the outset, it could be read as a controversial example, but really in the 21st century, almost every example that we think of that determines consciousness of the individual or group is becoming controversial because we're in a time now where our culture globally is redefining itself, even during the time you listen to this lecture. So I'm gonna take this one tiny little example from American society because that's who the university that I am teaching at at the moment is part of. It's part of the Tennessee State University system and in a larger sense, the Southeast College Art Association or you know the arts that have college art programs within the Southeast of the United States. And then the larger umbrella would be College Art Association, which is a nationwide organization. So it's fair to say that it's within American society, this particular example that I'm gonna give you. So as a member of this society, I was brought up and as members of this university, it's most likely that most of you were brought up to believe that men and women were equal. As a group, Americans strive and always have to make equality reality for all American systems. But for the moment, I'm just talking about men and women for just, and so this is just an example. As individuals, so me, Carol LeBaron, I'm aware that my experience might place me as a, at a disadvantage because I'm a woman. This is a reality that I grew up with and it's still there. However, ideologically, in the United States, we are meant to be equal. So think about this and think about other countries in the world. How do they view the status of women? So China, France, Arabia, Pakistan, Norway, Spain, Mexico, Brazil, Canada. You know, think about any of those, think about what you actually know about them and how they might or might not view women. How do some other countries view the status of women, especially in comparison to men, but also in comparison to American views? So some may be similar, some may be different, and I'm not going to put a construct of good or bad or pejorative. We're just looking at different ways that pe two genders look at one another within the contracts, constructs of different countries.
And I might add to this, just because of the conversation that the world is having today, within a global framework. So the status of men and women in a society is only one example of how groups view themselves. So the individual within the group, the group of women, group of American women, or group of college women, or group of, you know, there's, there's many different types of subsets that you could make in all of these different groups of men and women sociologically, but this is not a sociology course, this is art history. So how the groups view themselves and how the individuals within the group view themselves and their specific set of circumstances and that critical awareness within these two layers and how they either, either dovetail or separate is what I'm talking about by the two meanings of consciousness. So you've had this example and done some thinking. You're thinking, huh, what is she going to say next? So Greek consciousness, ancient Greece arose out of the Mycenaean civilization, which I've said. So from, for 200 years, we have this period. It's called Dark Ages. It's Dark Ages of Greece. And you've heard of the Dark Ages. We're going to see another one called Dark Ages in early medieval. But this is Greek Dark Ages. And it's a lot like the intermediate period in ancient Egypt, which it's a time when there's turmoil. There's no central authority. There's a lot of fighting. So remember Senraset, that tired looking king of the Middle Kingdom? You know, that's, that's what we're talking about here. Exchanges of power, different cities. Straits. So we have this turmoil, we have this chaos, and ancient Greeks will construct their identity out of that. So for the ancient Greeks, living with this changing, undefined, random impressions of life was very anxiety producing. They call this chaos. And chaos is a state of being which occurs when there is no sense of order. So as a culture, as they evolved, they felt the need to superimpose order on this flux of physical and psychological experience. So as a group, for, for whatever reason this was, because we've seen the rise of other civilizations, we saw the Sargon, we saw the ancient Egyptians, they didn't have this driving need to superimpose order, but there was something within, you know, ideologically for the Greeks that the only way that they could find to make sense out of the world they were in was to create some sort of sense of order. So what they did was they analyzed their world, they categorized their world, they measured their world. So they invented geometry, musical scales, philosophy, literature, which explored all of the human beings' relationship with their world, their gods, and each other. So the Greek poets and the Greek writers were interested in the human experience or human consciousness. So their works of literature and art explore psychology. The Iliad by Homer is a good example, and a lot of the art that we will look at is based on stories from the Iliad and also Homer's other epic, the Odyssey. And I've recommended this to you before. This movie, Troy, is a very, very good movie to watch because it's an illustration of the way their psychology happened in action. It's very true to the, to the reality of the Iliad. It's impossible to understand Greek art without understanding their religion somewhat. And so they believed that the creation of the world involved a battle between the gods and the titans. And the sky gods actually live on a mountain. They live on Mount Olympus, and it's up in the northeast corner of the Greek mainland. And they had human faults and emotions. And their sanctuaries, so the Greeks had sanctuaries that were sacred to their local gods. They were a sacred ground. They always had outdoor altars and a sacred natural element. This is a reconstruction drawing of the sanctuary of Apollo, and it's a little bit later. It's actually archaic construction, but it's a really good example of the kind of thing I'm talking about just in terms of what their religion was. So they believed that this is the place where Apollo fought and killed Python in part of the creation of the world, and they believed that the sky was attached to the ophelos of the earth by an umbilical cord. 
So there were all sorts of different buildings, but also outdoor sanctuaries as well. And it's worth your while to study just some of these different words. Halos, for example, is outdoor pavement, which is, you know, different areas of halos in this. The oracle is actually a place where a god was believed to communicate with humans. So there was an oracle at Delphi where you could go and talk to the god. And then there was a stadium, always a place for athletic events, which were central to Greek society. And then all the different city-states had different treasuries where they stored their valuables. So this entire complex would be called Temenos, which is a lot of temples together in a sanctuary ground. So there was a spring up here. We're not really sure, but we think right here it's where this Cassitus spring was, which is an outdoor sacred area. So a really good way to learn about the Greek consciousness is to read Greek myths. Just, you know, you can Greek Google it. There's a few in your book, but the more of these you read about the Greeks and the gods and the goddesses, plus they're fun to read, the Greek gods took human form and they had very human reactions for, to experience. For example, Zeus, who's the main god, he's married to Hera, who's the main female god, and he has lots of affairs with mortal women, and a lot of the sculpture that you see has to do with things that happened as, you know, repercussions. Hera was very jealous, and she did bad things to the people that Zeus had affairs with. These are human ways to behave. And the Greeks gave human attributes to their gods. So they're basically a lot like humans, only they live forever and they have supernatural powers. It's one way to think about them. The ancient Greeks studied human behavior and they looked at it within their gods and they accepted that there was good and bad behavior. And they re represented that study through their art. And through their art, they also completely mastered the representation of the human form because as you'll see, it's within the human form that they find their ideals of perfection. So they developed different categories for different kinds of behavior. And they're, there's two different kinds of behavior, not to say that one's good and one's bad, but they're completely diametrically opposite, if you will. And one is ethos, which is the state of being in control. It's an ordered response to experience. And ethos comes to the forefront as Greek culture solidifies itself and arises out of the Mycenaean soup of disrepair and discord. Pathos is an emotional state of being or an emotional response to experience. And so they depict this state as well. So you'll see how the works of art that the Greeks create capture these two categories of human consciousness. Here's an image of one of the earliest Greek temples. Now, of course, we don't have the temple itself. This is a model of a temple, and it was found at the sanctuary of Hera on Argos, and it was made around the 8th century BCE. So oftentimes, by finding these little models or different artifacts, this is a way that we can learn about what things looked like. So as I've said, from their earliest history, the Greeks worshipped at outdoor altars within walled sanctuaries, and but they also began creating temples and their temple architecture became some of the greatest architecture and created some of the wonders of the world. This is a ceramic model of an early, early temple and it shows us how the early one might have looked. So you can see there's a porch in the front and then the roof is forming a gable in the facade. The walls and the roofs now, of course, have disappeared. We only have foundations, but we can extrapolate from the foundations what the rest of it would have been like. So part, some parts in this temple are precursors of much more complicated structures, which we'll see. The plan of the temple was developed from the Megaron, and I'll refer you back to that sanctuary of Apollo, and also I've got a, in a later lecture, we've got a plan of the hill in Athens um, dedicated to Athena, at which the Megaron is the, the audience. And the audience hall becomes the main room of this temple, or the cella. There was always a statue of the god in the middle, where the hearth would have been in the Megaron. So where they began is outside worship. It turned into inside worship with some of the same elements in it. And so the reception area in front of the audience hall in the Megaron is the temple vestibule, vestibule hall, or proneos, which is the part in front. Here is the floor plan of the Siphnian treasury at Delphi, which is an early, early archaic temple 
built around 530 to 525, their building styles really didn't change much. They get more elaborate, but they really always build with post and little construction. And then they just change their orders of columns and the entablatures. So familiarize with yourselves with the vocabulary. And we're going to look at sculpture on the metopes and the frieze and the pediments. So familiarize them yourself with the terms and figure out where they are on the buildings. So this is sort of a bird's eye view of that little temple that you saw earlier. And the inside is the cella. And then these are columns are called in antis or in front. So now we can go into our study of the periods of Greek art. So as I've said, the first period that we're gonna look at is called the geometric period. And their objective is to find order in the variety of human experience by analyzing forms into their component parts. They, so they start out with geometry and they analyze everything that they depict into geometric shapes. This is a funerary vase and this was created around 750 to 700 BCE. So it's a very, very early example of Greek ceramics. And so notice the use of geometry in the forms. The human figures are divided just into simple triangles and the horse as well. You can notice on the upper and lower register. So what they're trying to do is bring order to an emotional subject. It's a funerary vase. So they're conveying this deep sense of human loss, but creating order out of it. Because if you get lost in emotion, you dissolve into chaos. So on the bottom, this is the funeral procession. You can see the horses and the carts. And up on the top is the funeral itself. And you can see where they're creating the funeral pyre and burning the body on top. So there's many, many of these large funerary vases, and they really exemplify this complex geometric decoration in this style. One important thing about this is the first time humans are shown as part of a narrative. So it's a very, very detailed record of funerary rituals for an important man. Now, we haven't seen this practice of cremation before. This is a new practice brought on by the Greeks. They're not embalming their figures and putting them into tombs. They are cremating them and letting the ashes go to the gods. Male and female mourners are on either side of the body, and you can see the funeral procession at the bottom. This is another one. It's a little bit different. So you see how similar it is. Very, very stylized. If you have to look at it really closely to realize that this is a different vase than the previous. So I had three slides of these. The first two are the same. This one's different. Notice the things that are say similar in the style. Abstract forms for the human figures triangles for four torsos and heads, rectangles for arms, long legs, tiny waists, very flat patterns, outline shape. So the difference between Greek and Egyptian funerary art, the Greeks are focusing on the emotional reactions of the survivors. We don't have supernatural beings. We don't have references to the afterlife. This is in the here and now. The Egyptians reflected the belief that the dead are going to continue to engage in activities enjoyed in life. They even had, if you'll remember, a book that they had to study to find out how to conduct themselves in the afterlife. All of those ideas are not existing here. Here is a centaur. This is late 10th century BCE. It's made out of terracotta. It's 14 inches high. This is actually, they call this proto-geometric. It's actually even before the geometric style, but you can see already the anticipation of these linear motifs, spirals, diamonds, cross hatching, total reduction of the human, the animal body parts to very simple geometric solid forms. Now, one thing that's really unusual about this is it's hollow. It's large and hollow. It was actually made on a potter's wheel. So that's interesting. We haven't seen this before either. The legs and arms, of course, are solid. And then what they did was they painted the designs on the outside with a slip mixture of water and clay. Now, an interesting thing about centaurs, or just as a footnote, is they had a good side and a bad side. Here's a geometric period bronze horse. So the Greek artists are looking for essential shapes to convey underlying structure. So it's reduced to very, very simple geometric shapes. It's not a specific portrait of a horse. Rather, it's meant to convey essential 
essential shapes that all horses share. And if you look back at the artwork on the vases, you can see that this is exactly the same as the drawing brought out into three dimensions. Here's another bronze sculpture of a man and a centaur. And this is from 750 BCE, so this is a very early sculpture. They resemble the figures on the pots. Notice the arrangement of the positive and the negative space. And most of these figures were found in sanctuaries, but we don't really know the meaning of them. The second period of art that we're going to look at here is what's called the Orientalizing period. This is a picture from Corinth, so circa 600. So by the seventh century, vase painters are starting to make open compositions. And style, this style began in Corinth. It's done in what's called black figure pottery style, which means it's black figures on top of white, very stylized flowers with rosettes, decorated with very dark shapes of lions, serpent creatures. So part of what's happening here is the Greeks are trading with the Persians. And Corinth was well known for its ceramic ware. So Corinthian potters often incorporated designs such as griffins from the cultures that traded with them. They wanted to make it saleable, so it's a commercial venture. You'll notice that some of the dates from the Orientalizing period and the geometric period do overlap. Here's another example of a vase from the Orientalizing period. It's called the Polyphemos Amphora. It was created between 675 to 650 BCE, and it's four feet high, so it's almost as tall as I am. Here's a detail. And so this is a story from Homer's Odyssey. Odysseus and his men are driving a stake into the eye of the Cyclops. In this particular story, the Cyclops captured Odysseus and his men, and he ate them one by one until Odysseus gave him wine and blinded him. And then they tied themselves to the undersides of Polyphemus's sheep to get away. And the audience, Odysseus is always called wily Odysseus because he was smarter than all his enemies. And so he won by wisdom rather than by brute force always.